you know how my channel banner says music and maybe some other stuff? Well, this is sort of what I had in mind. Believe it or not, I've always had a passion for game reviews, and as a kid, whenever I wasn't watching CN or Disney Channel, my main source of entertainment were reviews of my favorite games. I don't really know what it was about them, but when they were really well made, even if I didn't necessarily agree with the opinions presented, I would still just find myself watching them multiple times over just for sheer entertainment value. People like some call me Johnny, Cat Dicarus, and the Completionist, not to mention numerous gameplay review channels such as NerdCube and ClementJ64, were some of my most watched YouTubers at the time, and I've always wanted to try my hand at sharing my own thoughts on games that I liked but still had some gripes with. Like many, my journey into the Need for Speed franchise started with what most were referred to as the Golden Era. You know, Hot Pursuit 2, Underground 2, Most Wanted, and Carbon. I also really liked Shift, but that was a little later so it doesn't really fit in, not to mention it was made by a different dev team. And speaking of devs, little did I know growing up that there was an entire era of Need for Speed games that concluded just a year before I was born and not made by the team that launched NFS into the mainstream. Today I want to take a proper look at the first 5 games of the once annual franchise and really see if I missed out. I wonder if I was born just in time. Picture this. It's 1996 and video games that tied into other products weren't complete train wrecks yet. That's right. Much like the semi-recent Super Street The Game, the Need for Speed franchise actually started out as a tie-in video game to an automotive magazine called Road and Track. However, unlike Super Street, it wasn't awful. Yeah, despite its age, the Need for Speed and its various ports actually hold up pretty well in terms of the overall driving experience. Even visually, it's not too bad, with rich and colorful environments brimming with details such as random background elements that make these locales surprisingly realized. For this review, I'm going to be looking at the PS1 version, as I feel like it's overall the most cohesive package, and it's the most accessible thanks to the simplicity of emulators such as Duck Station or even EPSXE. Need for Speed has always been more of a quality over quantity kind of franchise when it came to its car lists, and never has it been more evident than here. While it only has 8 cars to start out with, which is absolutely minuscule by today's standards, each one comes with its own unique showcase video and narrated presentation detailing things such as performance and brand history. A direct descendant of the sharp-edged Countach that practically coined the term exotic, the Lamborghini Diablo retains the mid-mounted 4-cam V12, swing-up doors, and all the excitement of the original in a more rounded, smoothed-over form. And as this game leans more towards the simulation side of the handling, each car also has a distinct feel in its weight and cornering. The game is divided into two race types, circuits and point to points. Remember a minute ago when I said that the driving holds up? Well, by that I specifically meant during the point to point events. Here, cars feel just heavy enough to really give you that sense of speed, while also providing the feeling of being on the edge of control, and since point to points don't offer too many corners, this is manageable. Where this game does show its age, however, are the circuit events. I mean, Jesus. It feels like they were designed with a different physics engine in mind. That weight and frequent understeer that makes the point to points exciting is what makes these circuits so infuriating to try and be competitive in. Not to mention the AI that just seems to be a group of F1 cars in disguise, because there's no way you could actually take these corners like they do. Adding to all this is the sheer length of these events. I mean, eight laps? Seriously? Look, I get it. The devs probably wanted to give you plenty of time to work your way through the pack, but the problem is, these physics, coupled with the AI, makes this a damn near impossibility. It's this kind of stuff that makes me really glad that this game basically just gives you everything from the start. Now, there are a few extra tracks, one of which is actually unique, although it's still a circuit, and the rest are just rally versions of existing tracks, along with a hidden car, but the real meat of the game is there from the get-go, and thank god for that, because the tournament mode was key to unlocking these that I would not have gone so easy on this game. And yeah, despite all that, I would honestly still recommend you check this game out, if only for the point to points, and just to see where this franchise started, because I, I still find it really fascinating how you can just go from, like, you know, high-speed exotics on the open road, the tuners in tight city streets and back, and then back again, all while still having a distinct personality in each game. Hold on, I need a minute. Top 10 main menu themes of all time, easily. So yeah, Need for Speed 2, releasing only a year after the PS1 port of the original, 
Sort of something that will end up becoming the franchise double-edged sword. A complete change in direction. And I mean, talk about a 180. Gone is that heavy and grip-based handling, and instead we've got a precursor to Criterion's future giants. That's right, Need for Speed 2 did break the drift 12 years before it would essentially become the status quo for the franchise. Not to say that's a bad thing, it's not only are the tracks perfectly manageable about it, but can also be completely disabled by switching over to simulation mode. Also yeah, this game introduces multiple handling styles, something that also in a way makes its way into future installments. And it's not just the handling that saw a revamp, just take a look at these tracks. We've gone from believable circuits of point to points across locations clearly attempting to mimic those of the real world to Hot Wheels. Okay, the tracks clearly take some inspiration from real life locations like Outback or Pacific Spirit for example, but it's clearly a lot more creative liberties have been taken this time. Speaking of tracks, there's also a lot more of them. As the game is now centered entirely around circuit racing, the number and variety of tracks has increased drastically from the first game. I mean, I'm talking from 4 to 8, taking you all across the world from Dark Void Place to Movie References the Level to Cut my life into pieces, this is my last resort! Anyway, in terms of game modes, Need for Speed 2 functions pretty much identically to its predecessor with the addition of Knockout Mode if you ask me, is easily the best way to play this game. Not only do you only have to complete two laps of each track as opposed to four, which helps the pacing, but due to the nature of a knockout styled event, races are way more tense and you're forced to learn the best lines to grip and or drift through and when to slow down so to not get airborne. As this game's track design, as I mentioned earlier, isn't afraid to throw realism out the window and your cars into the air. Okay, so on to my overall thoughts on this game. Need for Speed 2 falls into this really bizarre field of game quality where it has everything working against it and yet it still comes out on top for me. Let me explain. Basically, this game feels less polished visually, is objectively buggier and more stitched together feeling for lack of a better word. The environment just looks like they're ready to fall apart on you, cars feel way too light to feel tangible in the game's world, and even the menus feel lazier. And in spite of this, I genuinely find myself booting this game up and actually just playing it for the fun of it. Mainly just a knockout mode. Something about nailing a corner with a properly timed drift or fucking over the AI by abusing the broken gravity, it just makes for an overall more fun game. If I had to compare it to some more conventional games like platformers, the situation kind of reminds me of Sonic Lost World versus Sonic Forces. While Forces is objectively more rushed, less polished, and not as challenging as Lost World, I still find myself going back to that game more often because it does something simple much better compared to Lost World in depth but not fully realized mechanics. Same goes for the run. While the ambition is clearly there, I feel as if the game was just too big for its own good and Black Box clearly didn't have the proper time to iron out the handling as it's just too heavy to the point of the game's detriment. That's pretty much all I've got to say about the second entry. It's honestly a really bizarre game in a lot of aspects. Hell, I haven't even brought the cheat codes, but we'd be here all day because there's so many of them. As far as recommendation goes, it really depends on your taste. If you like a more sim-like experience with better overall production, polish, and more developed feeling locations, either stick to the first game or stick around for the last entry today. And if you're more into the burnout style, just go like hell gameplay, then Need for Speed 2 will be just for you. Cops versus Racers, the dynamic that defines this franchise, and no, it didn't start with Hot Pursuit. Yeah, Cops were actually a part of the first ever version of Dundee for Speed for the 3 do but they weren't really the main attraction. Now with Hot Pursuit, the Cops take center stage, in theory. Okay, so yes, Cops are back, and they are more properly implemented. But before I get ahead of myself, I just want to mention that I don't really feel like they were quite ready with this installment. As a part of the Need for Speed franchise, the third installment is yet another change in direction. Not as drastic as before, but still worth mentioning. Stylistically, we retained that techno music aesthetic from the sequel, but it's now even more reflected in the UI and menu styling and as for the gameplay, while it's still arcade, it is significantly different from before. Instead of changing drifts and memorizing long sweeping corners, cars are much more, for lack of a better word, nippy or snappy. Basically, at least on the PC version, it feels like you can pretty much turn 90 degrees on a whim and the track design even reflects that, like Hometown or Country Woods. Speaking of tracks, NFS3 has a pretty different approach to his track setup. Instead of 8 unique tracks, this time we really only have 4, but with 2 variants of themselves offering a different aesthetic and layout. Also there's an unlockable track, Empire City, although it only has one variant, so I don't really consider it part of the main set. Interestingly enough, enabling the cops on this track feels a lot like a precursor to Most Wanted, especially in the COK GTR, because, you know, GTR. Now when it comes to the cops, this is where this game gets a little weird for me. Obviously they're the big selling point, and at that time, I can imagine getting chased by AI that communicates sort of realistically and uses weapons to try and stop you would seem as really cool. But being completely honest, 
The cops on their own just aren't enough to keep a race engaging, and due to what I can only imagine are technical limitations, you can only have one regular AI opponent to race against. As I said earlier, I feel like this mechanic simply wasn't ready to be a part of the franchise at this point. Now with Hopper Suit 2, thanks to the obvious leap in generation, not only are the cops more aggressive, but you can actually have more than one AI opponent to add even more to the action. Before I move on to high stakes, since I don't really feel like there's that much to add to this, I just want to bring up something that I've surprisingly neglected up until now. The soundtrack. My god, if there's one element of all these games that hasn't seen a day and age, it's the music. Right off the bat, the very first entry had an assortment of prog rock and electronic tracks, and while it's really great background music, I feel like it wasn't quite as memorable as its successors. Now with the sequel, things really pick up. You already heard me gush over the main menu theme, but that's not the only great track here. All the level themes are now far more diverse, mixing in elements of pop, electronic, metal, prog, and even folk music. Even cooler is that the music is segmented per stage, so different parts of songs play depending on where you are on the map. Carrying on the tradition, Hot Pursuit features an OST that is not only once again interactive, but also customizable. Yeah, you can now pick between the rock or techno variants of each song while retaining the ability to select an individual song to race to, like in Need for Speed 2. Stylistically, it's not quite as diverse as the sequel, but it does offer way more memorable melodies and riffs. Seriously, Rear Flutter Blast 19 and Aquila Trio Tree are absolute bangers that perfectly represent the vibe of the two variants of the tracks Atlantica and Aquatica, respectively. At the end of the day, Need for Speed Tree Hot Pursuit is easily the most iconic of the games we're going to be looking at today, and while its successor improves upon almost every aspect, spoiler alert, it still has this unmistakable and unreplicatable freshness and pick up and play fun factor, aided by its visuals and soundtrack that easily makes it, while my personal top pick, one of the most memorable, and from what I've gathered, most fondly remembered games of not only this era of Need for Speed, or even just the franchise, but the racing genre as a whole. What's this? An NFS sequel that doesn't completely change its driving mechanics, art direction, and general design language? That's right, Need for Speed High Stakes is essentially an expanded version of Need for Speed Tree with more tracks, cars, and a campaign? Yeah, we got some actual progression here. As opposed to just completing two to four laps of each track to unlock some bonus cars or a bonus track, we've now got a mode in which you start in a low-level vehicle, you work your way through tiers of tournaments to unlock faster cars and harder tracks. Sound familiar? During set tournaments, the game's namesake comes into play. Certain events will have you racing only one opponent with a chance to win their car, but the catch is, they can also take your car if you lose. And since the game also has an upgrade and repair system, you probably wouldn't want to lose a car that you pour tons of money into. Now, if it sounds like I'm glossing over a lot of this, it's because I kind of am. Since I'll be totally honest and say that while it was the first in the franchise, this is easily one of the weakest career modes of any Need for Speed game, and it all comes down to a problem I alluded to way back in the original. Race length and repetition. At first, tournaments don't take too long, sporting only two or three races at two laps apiece, but soon enough, you're going to be doing more than five tracks in a row with four laps each, and after a while that adds up. The sheer number and variety in locales helps take the edge off since more tracks means less potential for repetition, but even that doesn't help with the sheer number of tiers and tournaments. I feel like I'm being a little harsh here, so let me lighten up a bit by saying that high stakes' biggest strength is not necessarily to be an attraction, but rather the parts that make it up. This game features nearly every car from Need for Speed Tree, plus some new ones, while also including every track from that game, as well as adding a whole plethora of new and visually striking tracks. I gotta say, for 1999, this game looks fantastic, with great use of color and lighting, and properly modeled car interiors as opposed to the sprites found in the previous games, lens flare, gears before it was standard for every game, and even fog that actually enhances the mood of the track, rather than just hiding the render distance. As you can tell, the game's got visual presentation covered, but how about that soundtrack? Well, I'm a little split. On one hand, the mini themes are some of the best stuff you can hear from a game from this era, with Sing the Rift being one of my favorite Rob DePrisco tracks out there. But on the other hand, I'm sad to say that the level-specific nature of the songs is gone, replaced with a more contemporary playlist method of providing the tracks, aka each track is chosen at random at the start of a race, and when it ends, it just goes to the next. And to compound this downgrade, the race music itself isn't quite as memorable or exciting in my opinion. Like, it just sounds like racing background music rather than what felt like full-on instrumental songs that were just as engaging as the races themselves. And you know, that kind of coincides with how I feel about this game as a whole. It's Need for Speed 3, but not as memorable. 
Despite all the improvements that it made, the whole thing just feels too iterative to feel like its own game, not unlike Shift 2. Despite being objectively better than the first, it just doesn't stand out enough for me to prefer it. And the thing is, if this were a different franchise, I wouldn't mind. Forza has basically made the same game 20 times, but I never had a problem with that seeing as that franchise was always about building off of a foundation and rarely shaking things up too much to make each game feel like a natural evolution from the last. But Need for Speed isn't like this. At least to me, these games have always been about offering something fresh every time. Even if, say, the handling is the same, everything else is a different vibe. Hell, right after High Stakes, you'll see that even the dev seems to agree with me with that because of how different the next game we're gonna look at turned out. So to sum up, do I recommend this game? Absolutely, but only if you really enjoy Need for Speed Tree and just want more of the same with a few tweaks. So far, with the exception of the first game, the version of the rest of these that I've been looking at has been the PC version using patches to get them working on Windows 10. But seeing as these games came out in the 90s and were published by EA, they inevitably got console ports, but what's a bit strange is that despite the fact that the PC versions are the obvious true versions of these games, the console releases all came out months earlier and were even worked on by EA Canada. The devs behind the first game, while EA Seattle handled the rest, with one exception that we'll look at later. So how do these titles that push the boundaries of PC hardware of the time hold up on the PS1? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but I'd say it's pretty good overall considering the limitations. Let me be a bit more specific though. Need for Speed 2, unlike the remaining entries on the system, is nearly identical to its PC counterpart. Same menus, handling, music, with the only exclusions being the special edition content, so no last resort unfortunately. Now, while you think that the game being the same as the PC version will result in the same game feel, you'd be mistaken. Due to the obvious technical restraints of the PS1, the game runs nowhere near as smoothly as on PC, and as a result, the responsiveness of your inputs is greatly hindered, which kinda sucks when this is easily the fastest game in this era. Keep in mind that while I was playing this on Duck Station and could have easily overclocked the internal CPU to achieve 60 FPS, I wanted to keep this mostly authentic, so as you can tell, all I've done is bumped up the resolution and applied geometry correction which just makes the game nicer to look at, without affecting the game feel. But holy hell was I tempted to increase the frame rate because with track design like this you need those extra frames. Needless to say, I don't think this version of the game is really worth your time considering that it's just a PC version but with less content and a low inconsistent frame rate. Although I do feel bad for the people who might have been turned off by this game and never given the sequel a shot, because that's where things pick up. Need for Speed Tree Hot Pursuit on PS1 is almost the polar opposite of its precursor. For starters, the menus have been reworked to be much more controller friendly, and in my opinion are far more aesthetically pleasing when compared to the PC version. Unfortunately, we are still missing some cars, but all the standouts are still here, and we've got all eight, technically nine, tracks from the PC version. That's a great start, but how does the gameplay carry over? Well, I'm happy to report that it's made leaps and bounds over Need for Speed 2. This time, instead of perfectly emulating the precise handling of the PC version at less than half the frame rate, EA Canada has developed a heavier and more grounded variant of the old handling, break the drift and all, while still giving the option to turn that off in simulation mode. I gotta say, while I still prefer the handling of the PC version as the tracks felt better suited for it, this is not a bad compromise. Cards were definitely heavier on PC, but seeing as the FPS is lower, a slower game speed is actually beneficial as you no longer feel like you have no time to respond. Something else I forgot to mention earlier is that along with the menus being redone, the in-game HUD saw a revamp as well. Again, I greatly prefer this look as it's far more streamlined and integrated more naturally into the gameplay, rather than being a big blue rectangle at the top of the screen. It does seem a little lazy to reuse that exact same design for high stakes though, seeing as on PC it was different. But speaking of high stakes, it's a bit of an oddball. On one hand, the game's impressive visuals carried over extremely well to the PS1, and I even think the more vivid color palette makes it look a little more appealing. Not only that, but the car models also look a lot more, how should I say, accurate, or at least more properly proportioned compared to their real-life counterparts. This is especially noticeable with the Super and Hyper cars. What makes high stakes on PS1 weird for me though, is the fact that despite these improvements, I didn't have a great time with this version. I guess it's trying to make the damage mechanics feel more substantial. The cars have been made far heavier even compared to Need for Speed Tree on PS1, and combined with the low frame rate and Gran Turismo style progression, the game's opening hours are a complete slog. Being perfectly honest, the only way I found any enjoyment out of this game 
was by using Duck Station's built-in cheats to give myself the best cars off the bat. And even then, it just didn't feel like the same fun arcade experience that almost surpassed its PC version like Need for Speed 3 did, while also not feeling quite as realistic as the next game in the series, Porsche Unleashed. By the way, I won't be looking at that game's PS1 version properly, it's far too different from the PC release with a new engine, tracks, and campaign, so it's a whole different beast on its own, worthy of a separate video. After High Stakes iterated upon the success of Hot Pursuit, the Need for Speed franchise decided to go back to its roots. And by that I mean Porsche Unleashed once again is nothing like any of the previous entries. We had some slightly realistic handling with the first game before abandoning it for the next three, and now we've got full on sim-like handling. Seriously, this along with the two career modes are the most standout things about Porsche Unleashed, so I feel like it'd be most appropriate to cover them first. As I just mentioned, the handling has seen a complete revamp once again, this time being not only the most realistic and punishing so far up until this point in the franchise, but also for the series as a whole. Not even Pro Street or two shift games are as unforgiving as this. Body roll is a major factor to consider with cornering and your car's grip fluctuates depending on the road's surface, current speed, and tire compound. This might be the first and only time a Need for Speed game has actually benefited from starting you off in a low-end vehicle, as attempting to drive the faster cars in this game with no prior practice is just out of the question. Speaking of which, that's exactly how this game's more traditional career mode, referred to as Evolution, is structured. You start out on a 356 and then simply work your way through the eras, purchasing and unlocking newer and better models that, thanks to the new handling model, actually feel distinct from one another. But you don't just buy cars here, occasionally you're given these little bonus challenges involving an insanely fast and expensive car, and should you complete said challenge, you end up getting that car for free, which is a really good incentive for actually getting good at the driving. Remember that damage and upgrade system from high stakes? Well that too has seen a huge overhaul, now cars can be modified with highly specific parts which actually make an impact on the handling model. It's honestly really refreshing playing not just a Need for Speed game but a racing game in general which actually makes you think about what upgrades you equip rather than just slapping on the best parts and calling it a day. But let's say you're looking for something a little less traditional, well Porsche secondary career mode Factory Driver is to this day still one of the most retroactively unique campaigns of any racing game, let alone a Need for Speed game. Unlike Evolution Mode, where you buy and maintain cars with your own money, here, Name the Game is completing challenges with cars that are provided for that specific event, but it's not to say you don't keep some of those cars though. After certain missions, some of the cars used during them are treated as rewards for making progress and even come with unique paint jobs. It seems that the developers were really proud of their handling model, since whenever you're not just driving through a track, you're on the skid pad, tasked with performing tricky maneuvers that genuinely requires some knowledge of the car's weight distribution and traction and all that stuff. A mode like this would get a little boring if it was just events with no flavor, and that's where Porsche Unleashed's cast of characters shines. Can someone tell me how a 22 year old racing game has more engagingly written characters than most modern games? Like, actually responded appropriately towards each of them instead of just writing them off as filler, you know? I hated Billy, I respected Dater, I looked up the step, and I felt kinda bad when Rolf had to retire. Not only were the characters an actual positive addition to this mode, rather than being a nuisance, but they also helped add context to some of the missions, like, for example, Dater's Late. I imagine the devs just wanted you to drive through the industrial area for a third time to add some padding, but instead of just giving you a car in a time limit with no context, they actually give the event a sense of actual purpose, like, oh shit, my guy's late for his train, better step on it. It's things like that which help create a sense of immersion in what is otherwise just a harder than average racing game. Porsche Unleashed's handling model wasn't the only element that felt like a return of form because this game's tracks are, just like in the Need for Speed, mostly point to point, and as I shared when I was covering that game, I'm a big fan of that format. Obviously, we still got some circuit tracks, but this time they were contextualized much better. Instead of just being loops and vaguely real world inspired locations, this game's singular circuit track and its variations lead into the game's more simulation esque handling model by actually being based off the real Monte Carlo circuit, aka Monaco. Let's get back to the point to points. This time they're much more traditionally structured, having just a single section rather than three like in the first entry, but thanks to the jump into the new millennia, tracks can now have branching pathways and a lot more variety and verticality. Courses like the Autobahn, for example, while still being a linear point A to point B type track, has so many different pieces of road to drive on that it almost feels like an actual open highway. By far the best in this particular aspect is Auburn. Not only is it an insanely detailed track down to the little sewage drains and alleyways, but it's so big that during the factory driver mission Capture the Flag 2, the game has you driving around the map collecting checkpoints almost like it was an open world type game. As for the game's visual presentation, 
Revolution, this is where it gets a little tricky. Basically, from a purely technical perspective, Porsche Unleashed obviously had its predecessors beat. The car models are higher in poly count, the interiors are more detailed, stages are larger and far more convincing than ever before, and you can actually race with traffic on and more than one opponent at the same time. Thing is though, aesthetically speaking, I'm a little mixed. On one hand, when you're in-game and only looking at the tracks and environments, the game looks great. Not even just for its time, but it has this timeless look, almost like the original Halo. What hasn't aged out well, however, is the approach to the menus in UI. While it's a lot more streamlined and conventional looking compared to the big boxes of the previous games, something about the color palette and assets just make it look kind of tacky and early 2000s web design-esque, which, you know, I guess makes sense. But just like what came before, the music is just as good as it was in the year 2000. The overall vibe of the soundtrack leans more heavily to the electronic side that was already present while incorporating some elements of funk, breakbeat, hardcore, and a ton of sampling. In fact, almost every track is some sort of weird vocal sample, which you'd think would make it sound more dated, but honestly, it only helps create the pseudo-modern sound that blends really well with the electronic beats and airy melodies. What stood out to me the most was the surprising amount of rock and even thrash influence in some of these songs. Stuff like metal guitar tones, the pentatonic and chromatic licks, I have no right blending this well with what is essentially up-tempo house. All right. Now that we've got the formalities out of the way, I want to share my honest thoughts on this game as an overall experience. How do I put it? Have you ever played a game which you can tell from a critical standpoint is extremely polished and well made, and yet your preference in games starts taking over and hindering your enjoyment? That's me with Porsche Unleashed. While playing the game, I recognized the attention to detail, production value, and design choices that made this one of the most well regarded racers of the year 2000. But something this game helped me learn about myself is that I just don't like racing games with realistic, heavy, and punishing handling. I like my cars to snap at a moment's notice, take corners like you never could in real life, and not worry about spinning out when braking for too long. If I were to recommend this game, it would really come down to your preference. If you like having your abilities pushed to their limits while completing deceptively simple tasks while also managing your own car's health and performance, then go right ahead with Porsche Unleashed. As for me, while I can't say that I feel as if I've wasted my time, I also can't say that I didn't feel like I was playing the game almost out of obligation at points. This is it. We've looked at every single classic era Need for Speed game, and you've heard what I have to say about each of them. And now comes the part where I tell you which one is best. But there's a problem. Do I decide that based on how each of the games is held up critically over time? Or do I rank them based on my personal level of enjoyment with each one? Well, as for the former, I think it's pretty obvious. Porsche Unleashed has undoubtedly stood the test of time best thanks to its insane level of detail and polish for the time, mechanical depth, and a clear focus on the experience of driving some of Germany's finest vehicles. High Stakes had a chance as well, as it does have far more variety in its content, but it lacks that sense of identity that was so strong, not just with the year 2000 release, but also all the games that came before. But now that we've got that out of the way, what is my favorite? To simply play, ignoring polish or objective design decisions or any of that. Well, I did some thinking, taking into account the ports as well, and I gotta say it's a close call between Need for Speed 2's PC version and Hot Pursuit's PS1 release. Both games perfectly capture what I believe to be the essence of the classic era of Need for Speed. Pick up and play arcadey goodness with unique locales and incredible music. Not to mention that what matters most to me, the act of driving the damn cars, is that it's most mechanically simple yet intrinsically rewarding with these two, even with the break the drift mechanics, which I honestly never had too much of a problem with, seeing as they actually fit the track design as opposed to say Need for Speed 2015. Alright, I'm really not sure how to end this, since I typically skip the outros and most reviews I watch, but uh, I guess all I have to say is thanks for sticking around. I've been thinking whether or not this should be a one-off or if I should actually keep making reviews alongside music related stuff and honestly I'm still a little on the fence as far as the direction I want this channel to go in. Don't get me wrong, I love making music and I've even got some more original stuff on the back burner but I've also got kind of an itch to try something new. Looking back on this project, I feel like I might have been a bit too ambitious looking at essentially 8 games for one video. And I can pretty much guarantee that if I were to make something like this again, I'll try to be a bit more realistic as far as scale goes. Now, I'm not going to tell you to stay tuned or tease another video or some cheesy shit like that. Uh, all I can promise is that there will be something similar to this in the future, but not sure how far into it. You know, Hopefully it'll be within the same year as this one. Again, thank you so much for bearing with me for 30 minutes. And uh, I guess you'll hear from me when I'm done with whatever I come up with next.